We're going to take a step out of the book of Hebrews today. We're going to go into Luke chapter 8. And we're going to look at the, the parable of the sower. And the, the parables of Jesus, um, a long time ago I, I decided I really wanted to start a study in, in the parables of Jesus. And for one reason or another I just, I just never got around to it. It always seemed like something else came up to study. And, uh, and I just kept getting you know, stuck on other things. And, and finally a few uh, weeks ago I decided that I was finally going to kick off this examination of, of the parables. Now the, the parable of the sower is not exclusive to Luke. You can find it in Mark chapter 4 and you can also find it in Matthew chapter 13. I believe that's right. Um, and it's, it's uh, subtly different in each rendition of, of the gospel uh, that, it's, that you find it in. But it's essentially the same story. Uh, I, I believe it's in Matthew. They go into a little bit more depth of explanation about uh, the prophecy of Isaiah that's, that, that Jesus would, would sometimes quote. But what I really love about the parables is that they are a great representation of the things that Jesus probably talked about all the time. And so it's probably the reason why all the disciples were able to recall these parables so often. Um, and, and, and so they could, they could recite this day in and day out because they were with Jesus and heard him teach these things all the time. And, and they just, there's certain teachings that just never get old. Like uh, well, Chris's message last week is a good, a good example. Um, I've, uh, I've been with Oasis now, I think coming up on almost 14 years. And, uh, and in that time, I think I've heard Chris preach that sermon at least one other time. And, I, and I, I love that message. I love that teaching. So much so that I was kind of like, I think this part's coming up next. And I, I got really excited about it. And so uh, these, these teachings uh, probably r uh, roughly approximate the, the kind of average things that Jesus would teach and do on a daily basis. And so I think that's one of the things that makes them cool. And, and one of the reasons why I'm preaching today... Uh, is because I actually wanted to preach this message. I, uh, you've heard me say a number of times, if you've been here any length of time, that I really don't enjoy preaching. It's a very stressful act, and I don't think I'm particularly good at it. Um, but this message I was actually really excited to share. I, I, was, I was going through the parable of the sower, and I, I, went, I went smile style, and I got me a little journal out here and started writing, you know, went old school, got my pen out and uh, started writing. And I just, I had such a good time in it, and I was so anxious to share it with you because I think it's an incredibly relevant message for where this church is at, at this current point in time. And, uh, and I'll share why I say that here in just a little bit. But let's go right to Luke chapter 8, and let's read the parable of the sower. We're also going to read Jesus' explanation of it. Now, you might be wondering why the gospel of Luke and not a rendering of the others. Just preference, I just I like the way Luke writes, and so that's why we're reading it from Luke. Uh, but we're not going to miss anything too huge or major if we don't read the others. But it's a great thing for you to do in your own time. Though it won't take five minutes out of your day. It's really, really short and easy. Uh, the parable of the sowers in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 4, we read this. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to Jesus, he said to them in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on rock, and as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. The other renderings say thirtyfold, sixtyfold, hundredfold. And as Jesus said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. 
And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit doesn't mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Let's pray again. Father, this is such a, such a powerful message that you gave a little miniature sermon that we, we all get to feast upon. And I, and I pray that, that as we've considered this text, I pray we take it from this place today and continue to feast upon it because there's so much good food here that can help us grow and get stronger in the word and mature. And so, Father, I pray that that happens, that for all of us, myself included, that we would feast on not just this message, but every message that you give here in this, in this wonderful book, this Bible. I pray that we would, we would know it more, love it more, cherish it more. And I hope this time helps us do that very thing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, when I read the parable of the sower for the first time, I have to admit that I went around for a while thinking to myself, they might as well call this the parable of the ground because that was the first thing I took away from it. And there's a whole series of sermons that you could do on the, the, the metaphor of the ground in, in, this, in this text. But I'll just say this about the ground. One of the things I'm always asking myself when I read the Bible, uh, particularly when I'm looking at exhortations in the Bible, is I ask myself, is this me? Am I such a person? And so you consider the seed that fell along the path. What kind of a person is that? That's a person who so easily has the truth snatched away from them. And how can that happen? It, it happens in, in no small part because oftentimes they simply do not have the armor of God securely fastened around their heart. And so it's so easy for them to lose that truth that was sown in them. It takes virtually nothing. They can go out and see something in a film or hear something in a song, or they can hear a passing by conversation and they'll immediately have their minds changed and the truth will be taken from them. But Jesus even goes so far as to suggest that Satan himself robs people of this truth. Satan himself or the schemes of the devil rob people of this truth so easily. And this makes me think of people who are like new converts, right? New converts are always what we think to be in kind of a precarious place, right? Because they need constant supervision, it seems, or they need someone to talk to them about the word. Now, I've been through this with people before, and maybe you have too, where it seems like they call you every other day, every other minute, and ask you questions and want to know things, and they monopolize a lot of your time. I've, I've been there. I've been there, but I was happy to do it because I wanted them to fasten on the word of God so securely around their heart so that they would not be swept away so easily by the schemes of the devil. And, you know, and, and I, I tell them, I said, listen, if you're, if you're not willing to dig in, it's a little like putting on a motorcycle helmet and then not bothering to fasten that motorcycle helmet down. You know, you get in a wreck, that helmet's just going to fly right off, and then what good does it do? And people along the path are like those who hear the word, and they, it's kind of like they just lay the armor on, but they don't really do anything with it. And so they're susceptible. They're so susceptible. But this could also apply to people who aren't new converts, people who just say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. You know, I had a student one time who, who said, uh, she said, you know, we, we all basically believe in God, and that's, that's enough, right? No. <laughs> you got to fasten on the Word of God. you got to, of course, have salvation in Jesus. There were a lot of things I could have said to this student that I chose to not say, but... Uh, but uh, the, the seed that fell along 
the rocky ground. I ask myself, what kind of a person is this? And am I like such a person? The kind of people I think of who are like the, the seed that fell among the rocky ground, I call them faith adrenaline junkies. Faith adrenaline junkies. And maybe you've known people like this too. People who hear the word, they receive it with joy, just like it says in the text here. And then they need one big thing after the next. They're always looking for the next big thing. You know, they might start at a church, and if the big thing's not happening at that church, they might go to another church and look for the next big thing. And maybe they find a church that has the next big thing going on. And they say, okay, I've heard the word, I've received it with joy, what do I do with it? And, the, and they'll say, okay, well, hey, listen, we're going to a conference. And the person's like, conference, I'm there, I love conferences, let's go. Go to the conference, have a great time, come back. What are we doing next? What are we doing next? We're taking a missions trip to Costa Rica. And that person's like, okay, I'm ready, missions trip, Costa Rica, let's go. And they come back from the missions trip, and they say, all right, what are we doing now? And then they, 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 what they get is, well, it's the summer, we're going to take a little bit of time off or whatever. And that person, oh, okay. What do I do now? <laughs> and, and I've seen this happen to a number of people in my life. It's a, it's a terrible thing to watch happen. And why? What's happening? They're not really drilling down into the bedrock of their faith. They're not putting down any roots. They're not spending any, any serious time with the Lord. And oftentimes, they've not had any real life change. They've just filled their life up with a little bit of that, uh, that little faith buzz. They're just always looking for that faith buzz, just trying to grab onto it, taste it a little bit. And, and it's, kinda, it's a little like a junkie. You know, once they get a little bit, they, they, they need more and more and more and more and more to sustain them. Otherwise, they just go crazy and die. You know, it, 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 this is that kind of a person. And we got to be on the lookout, not only on our own hearts for it, but we have to be very careful when we're sowing seed to people who are, who are like this because we have to help them drill down, set a root in the word. And then I ask myself, what kind of a person is like the seed that fell amongst the thorns? And this is, I think, perhaps maybe the most common thing that we deal with in our lives, or one of the most common things we deal with in our lives is people who have heard the word and they're resistant to it because everything else is always in the way. You know, these are the kind of people who always say things like, you know, if I could just get a better job and make a certain salary, then I would be satisfied. Or if we could just get uh, this project done at the house, I'd be satisfied. Uh, if we could just uh, get the kids in this school, then we'd be satisfied. Or if we could get this friendship or relationship at work to be this way, then we'd be satisfied. We encounter things like this all the time. There's a good chance you even struggle with a thing like that. And I believe that's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about people who allow the cares of the world to consume them. And what happens in a moment like that is an exchange, and it's a terrible exchange. And that exchange is this. It's that people forget or misplace the idea that Jesus is infinitely valuable and infinitely worthy, and therefore we can lean on him entirely and recognize that he's got everything. He's taken care of everything. That we don't have to fret about our lives. But then you also have the other category of people that Jesus mentions, which is people who are obsessed by worldly things, worldly cares. And I've run into this too, where people literally, because of their attachment to material things, they were willing to allow ministry to suffer so that they could maintain their addiction to worldly things. I watched it happen very recently, actually, in my life, and it was a terrible thing to watch that exchange take place where someone was just so willing to say, I'm going to take this earthly thing over the godly thing. So that happens a lot. So those are my observations about the ground. And again, we could go on and on and on about the, the various uh, elements of it. But I want to talk more about the sower in this, in this parable. And the reason why I think this is a really relevant message for our church now is because I know that I've been considering, and I know some of the other Oasis, well, I think a lot of the Oasis elders have been considering this question. We've talked about it. We've asked this question, you know, God, 
what is the purpose that you have us here in the Athens community for? What, what is it that you want us to do? I think we're coming up on, is it three years maybe that we've been? Yeah, we're coming up on this September. We're coming up on three years in Athens. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been great thus far. And, uh, and this, is a, this place has been a huge blessing for three years now. Um, and, and we, you know, I feel like we have a, a pretty nice service. We get together and we do things together and it's great. But I, I, I'm sure you feel like me in that that's not all. That's not all God wants us to do, I know. I know. Because when we talk about sowing as individuals, when we talk about sowing as a church, I think that we recognize that God has a purpose beyond a group of like-minded people getting in a convenient location once a week, you know? And, and that's, that's kind of what churches become, sadly, a lot of times, is groups of like-minded people saying things to each other that everybody agrees with. And, and, that's, and that's the, it's a trap. And it's a very dangerous trap. And no church ever wants to fall into that trap. One of the primary functions that the disciples served early on was they went out and made other disciples. They sowed, they sowed the word, they sowed the truth in people's hearts. And what's interesting about this example that we have here is of the four examples of seed sowing that we have in this text, three of them fail. Three out of four fail. That's not exactly a great success rate. It's a, it's a pretty terrible one, really. What does it tell us about seed sowing? It tells us that seed sowing is hard. It is difficult. And it will often fail. And maybe you've had people in your life, many people in your life, who you've went out and sown the truth to, and it just did nothing. It did nothing to change them. Maybe of all the categories of people that we just spoke about in, in the ground metaphor, maybe you've been there ministered to people like that. I've even said it before. I said, I feel like I spend most of my time failing in, in, the, in the objective of being a seed sower. I feel like very rarely does the seed I sow fall on good soil and yield and, and yield uh, good things and, and bear fruit and grow maturity in people's lives. And it can be easy to feel that way as a believer. And as a church, I believe that one of our purposes in this community is to affect this community with the gospel. I think it's one measure, one reason why churches form and get together is to go out into the community and, and tell people the truth, sow that truth. The way the disciples often achieved this was they would just go to the public square and they would just sow seed and they would often get rejected even you know beaten to death virtually sometimes and then they would go back in and they just keep on doing it they just keep sowing seeds and so here lately i've started to ask myself you know what can we do in athens and one of the things i want you to join me in praying about and being proactive and coming up with ideas about it's the same thing the elders are sort of doing right now is is god how do you want us to reach out into this community how do you want us to how do you want us to operate and make the community aware that that there is this great truth that we have and that great truth is Jesus and we want to share it because listen every one of us in this place who claims faith in Jesus Christ every one of us is a sower you might think that being a sower is a job that should be left to the mature Christians or the preacher and I don't know why I'm speaking in quotations right now but you might think that being a sower is a special job that requires special training and therefore you want to be careful to not do it because you might not be fully qualified. No, that, that, that's not it. Listen, our, the core fundamental truth of our faith is this. We're sinners. We need a Savior. Jesus is that singular Savior. Make sure you stress that. Singular Savior. There is no other way. That's the fundamental truth of, of our religion, if you want to call it that. I don't call it religion. I call it the truth. That's all you got to know. That's all you got to know to be a seed sower. Now, can you grow a lot from there? Sure. Can you talk about a lot of other things from that point in place? Absolutely. But how many times do we see in the Bible, one small thing happens, one little seed gets sown, and someone runs off and tells everybody they know about Jesus. They didn't take a class. They didn't read a book. They didn't have a Bible. Many of them were probably illiterate. 
many of the, especially the, the, the lower class people who Jesus, Jesus often interacted with. They just had the word that they had heard and they had it in their heart and they took it out to other people. You don't need any special qualifications other than just love Jesus. That's it. That's all you got to do is love Jesus. Make sure you're growing from that point, learning more, sure. But that's all that you need. So we can all be seed sowers. So what do we need to do? I ask myself that question a lot. I want you to think about it even more too. Because I have crazy ideas all the time like, There's ways we could reach out to the student population. There's ways we could reach out to the local population. There's a lot of ways that we can affect change, whether that's getting involved in a parade and passing out water. Some of us remember those days, the the parade and water days. Uh, You know, going out to to difficult or even unpopular places, uh, places where we might be scorned. You know, if you've been around Athens any time, you know that one of the only examples of public you know, sort of preaching and outreach that people are familiar with are the Brother Jeds. You guys know who I'm talking about? These are the people who stand out in front of the gateway of, of the, uh, uh, the, the green, whatever it's called, where Chubb Hall is. And, uh, and they sit around with like, they've got you know, signs with like babies on fire and things like that. And they shout and scream a lot and they yell at people as they go by. And you're damned right to hell. Everyone's going to hell. And that's, that's the Brother Jeds. And, and sadly, that's what a lot of this community who doesn't know Jesus thinks about in the Athens community. I know it's what I think about or used to think about when I was in school here. I'd like, I'd do everything I could to avoid those people when I was walking up to get some lunch at Taco Bell when I was in school, you know. Those people were horrifying. And oftentimes I wanted to just stop and say, how many people a day actually stop and listen to what you're saying? And how effective is what you're doing? And probably not very. And see, I think we as a people, I think we could change something like that. And I'm not talking about exclusive ministries to the student population, because as you know, this is a super diverse community, not just in the student population, but the rural community of Athens in particular is, is wildly diverse as well. But it is a tough place. And you, and you know it's true. A lot of churches, just, they just fail here. They just fall flat on their face. Or they shrink down to nothing. I really believe that we could change that. I, I, I do. And I, I, I hope you believe it too. Because I think we could be seed sowers in this place. And you know what? We're going to fail a lot. But occasionally... What we sow in this community is going to hit good soil. And it's going to multiply 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And we can do that together. I know that we can. Now, while you're considering that point, let me give you probably my favorite example of seed sowing that I've ever heard in my life. I I heard this story... uh, Ten years ago. Sorry, I couldn't think what year it was. I was like, is it 2016? <laughs> oh boy, I tell you, it's, how, how early can you get memory loss? Um, yeah, ten years ago I heard this story. And it's a true story. And, and I heard John Piper tell the story. And it's just stuck with me. And I think it's a great example of seed sowing, although he didn't use it in that context. Um, the story is this. Uh, some years ago... Billy Graham was hosting uh, an international minister's conference of some sort. And somebody showed up at this conference. And and they were an African Maasai tribal warrior named Joseph. Now, I don't know if that was his birth name or if he changed his name to Joseph. But Joseph shows up at this conference. And he starts telling his story to some of the uh, event staff that's there. And they're so blown away by what they hear him say that they say, we have got to get you to Billy so that you can tell him this story. This is a story that people need to hear. And so the story is this. Again, it's a true story. This is not an illustration. This really happened. One day, Joseph was walking along a road outside of his village. And he encountered a man who shared the gospel of Jesus with him, i.e. sowed the truth. And in this case, there was instant success. The seed cast fell on good soil. And Joseph immediately, after hearing about this 
miraculous truth of salvation in Jesus Christ, the first thing he wanted to do was go tell others, sow seed. So he, as quickly as he could, returned to his village and he started going door to door, telling everybody that he could possibly find about the message that he had just heard. And rather than receiving this message with joy, these people who had known him his whole life, remember he's in his hometown, they grab him and they start to beat him. And by beat him, I mean beat him. Joseph said that the women even picked up cords of barbed wire and hit him with it. And he said all he remembers is passing out and then waking up somewhere out in the wilderness. And it was one of those beatings that was kind of like a left for dead type of beating. So Joseph spent a few days passing in and out of consciousness and eventually he managed to get himself to a watering hole and he started to have a little clarity and started to come to and his wounds started to heal a little bit. And he was perplexed by the reaction that he'd gotten in his hometown. Again, people that have known him and loved him his whole life. Why would they respond like this? And his thought was that he must have said something wrong. He must have communicated the message in a weird way. So he sat at that watering hole and he rehearsed this message, saying it out loud, just making sure that he had it clear in his, in his head. And so he made his way back to his village and he went and stood in kind of the public circle of the village and said, Jesus Christ died for you so that you might have life. That's about all he got out before the villagers seized him again and proceeded to beat him in precisely the same fashion as they did the first time. Now, surviving the first beating was <laughs> lucky, if nothing else, Surviving a second beating of this nature would be something of a miracle. But he did survive. And he woke up out in the wilderness yet again. And once again, it was a left for dead type of beating. He wasted no time. He got his bearings and still cut, hurt, bruised, battered. He made his way back into his village. Except this time, he didn't even get to get a word out. They seized him and beat him again. And Joseph said that before he lost consciousness, he noticed that some of the women who were beating him had stopped beating him and had begun to cry. When he woke up, he wasn't in the wilderness. He was in his own bed. And the same people who had just tried to kill him were now desperately trying to save his life. What was the result of his seed sowing? His entire, entire village came to Christ. We think of... Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a great story, right? I love that story. It's, a, it's always hard to get through it without tearing up. I was like, he, he lives and they all come to Christ. Um, seed sowing is a, is a tough thing. But when you're ready to die for the truth, then nothing's really impossible. I always say the truth is like water. It always finds a way out of wherever it's at. Never fails. What is the mission that God has you on? What is the mission that God has us on? It's a great question. And I believe that in our lives, we're a people made and built to sacrifice. A people made and built for the express purpose of worship. 
we are not our own. And we have a commission and a command. And that commission is sort of laying in our laps and our hands. And how will we answer the call? I think that we can answer it in a powerful way. I believe that if we hear the word, if we receive it with joy, and then bear fruit, that God, not us, God will change things. And I believe this community can be changed. Because Athens is not the hardest community in the world. At least the Brother Jeds can stand out on College Green and shout about hell without being seized and beaten. At least we have the freedom to come into a public place like this, albeit, you know, some of these freedoms get restricted. But we do have the freedom to be here. We do have the freedom to assemble wherever we would like to and talk about God, preach about the Word of God, sing songs about God. And we also have the freedom to sow. God has given us the freedom to sow. He's given us the expectation to sow. And so, as we leave out from this place today, as we sing a few more songs, we get ready to take communion, I hope that we'll all consider very carefully what we're prepared to sacrifice in the kingdom of God. That's a rough question. It's a rough question. It's a seed among the thorns type of question. What are we prepared to sacrifice for the kingdom? What are we prepared to lose for the kingdom? What are we prepared to do for the kingdom? How faithful are we prepared to be to God, not to a church, not to people, but to God? How faithful are we prepared to be? Good sowers, of which I have to admit, sometimes I don't think I'm a very good sower. Sometimes I think I'm a real poor sower. But I think a good sower is ready to lose it all. Because they don't run a race that ends at death. They run a race that ends in eternity. And that's a comforting thought. And I have to believe that that's part of what drove Joseph back into his village time and time again. Was I, I, I run a race whose finish is not in this life. So I believe that as we... Yeah, we got everybody. Um, as we come into this time of communion... And take the emblems and remember the call that Jesus has placed in your life. Think about the call that Jesus has placed in your life. And if you're not sure what that is, don't freak out. Don't freak out. There's no reason to freak out. Um, it's all just a part of the process. Just ask. Just ask. Talk to people. God will give it to you. He'll reveal it to you because he's made you for his purpose. So let's pray, and then, uh, Space, you're going to lead us out today. I'll pray Space comes up. Father, uh, make us brave. <laughs> make us brave in, in your kingdom. May we cast off worldly fears, worldly cares. May we cast off attachments to earthly things. May we fulfill, may we fulfill the word that says, die to ourselves daily. We pray that we would become the kinds of sowers who are always encouraged by the fact that you are with us. And that no matter where we go, what we do, and no matter what we say, and wherever place we say it, that you will be with us, and that you will sustain us. And we thank you for making us sowers. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to deliver your truth in every waking breath 
Because that truth is always real. That truth is always vibrant. So may we live out our lives like a people who have a vibrant truth that is teeming out of us. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love when I hear your voice.